Hello, and welcome to this week's Octatrack video. So we are about to begin the foray into MIDI, and uh, I should probably have some disclaimers um, before I get started. Um, I am not the manual. I do not know everything about how MIDI uh, works, which is partially why I've avoided the subject up until now. Um, but I am also a little bit less dry than the, than the manual. So if you're looking for a quick um, entry point to the world of MIDI in the Octatrack, um, I will do my best to give you a quick start guide on uh, getting things set up, and then just a little bit about um, some of the things you can do to play around with, um, with the Octatrack. Starting from a blank machine, um, I would go into the settings real quick. Um, we're not going to spend too much time in the settings because uh, there are some things in there that I don't fully understand, but we are going to go to Control and uncheck so under the MIDI section of the project settings, we're going to go to Control, and we're going to turn off CC in and Note in. So I believe what that does is that keeps the CC and the notes of your MIDI instrument that's plugged into your Octatrack, keeps them from sending commands to the Octatrack, as though it were, like, I've noticed some issues where I'll play like a middle C and it'll create the sound, it'll start arming the first track or something. So to prevent any of that uh, mess, I just uncheck these two. So moving on down to sync, I'm going to turn transport and clock to send. So this allows me to send the MIDI uh, s clock and transport. So if I'm plugged into Ableton, I can tell it to start playing with the transport sync. Um, but I'm also sending the, uh, the metronome speed of the Octatrack to the, uh, the MIDI instrument. And um, just for a, a, a bit of a disclaimer, my OB6 is not doing that right now, and I still haven't figured out exactly why it doesn't follow the, the clock. But uh, that's my problem and not yours. I've noticed that it works well with the base station, so other synths should be fine. Um, within channels, I have my auto channel set to 11, which is left over from my uh, base station. My current synth is set to uh, channel 1, so I'm just going to do that. And that's pretty much all I need to do within the uh, Octatrack settings for now. So to get a signal from the, uh, the synthesizer, there are two different things I can do. I can go into my mix uh, settings here, and I can turn on direct in, which is right here, corresponding to this knob. All right, so the second way that I can set up a, uh, a direct um, input from my keyboard is by setting up a through machine. And uh, if you have any experience with through machines, this is fairly straightforward. Um, you turn on the through machine, you set the input to either one, the other, or both. In this case, I have a stereo in, uh, signal. So I have my direct in right here. And I also have to have a trig on this first sequence. All right, so moving on to the MIDI menu. Um, basically, you just hit MIDI right here. And now we have eight uh, simultaneous MIDI tracks, which we can operate um, alongside the eight audio tracks. So for every bank, um, every part, you can rearrange these and set them up in different ways, the same way that you could set up like the different effects on the uh, audio side or change out the machines. So that becomes very versatile. Um, so um, in order to do that, we're going to take the first instrument, set it to channel one, and you'll notice that, it's, that the uh, keyboard is starting to respond a little bit. So if I set this to uh, program nine, you'll see that my keyboard just switched directly to nine, and then four, and so on. If I set it to a number over three digits, or uh, three digits or above, it doesn't respond. Um, and I think it has something to do with the way that the OB6 uh, processes these numbers. So like, I've had some trouble getting numbers that are beyond, um, so like the OB6, for example, has up to 999 um, patches. Um, and I've noticed that at least on this particular instrument, um, the bank value doesn't actually change anything. So. I've had to basically hardwire uh, the first digit of this three-digit number. 
um, and say, for example, if I'm going to perform, all of my performance patches are under the 300 uh, setting, which is perfectly fine. Um, and you might just have to finagle that and see um, how your particular instrument corresponds. So this is one of the reasons why MIDI can get a bit dicey when you're explaining it. Um, but in any case, we now have a um, program changing abilities. So say we go to channel 7, which is my favorite. All right, so when you're in this MIDI menu, um, these trigs are going to operate similarly to when you have uh, a trig in the other uh, menu. So like if I hit these trigs, there's a default setting that you can look at within these menus. And then beyond that, you can hold down the trig and adjust. So if I go like this, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a bunch of just single 16th notes. And I'm actually gonna change this again just to Give us a clearer note. And then, you know, it's just like anything else with the Octatrack, you can kind of adjust what the notes are. Um, one important thing to note in this case is that you cannot assign MIDI to the, uh, the crossfader. In fact, there's very little in the MIDI section that you can assign to the crossfader. I don't even know if there's anything. Um, so just go ahead and operate off of that assumption. Nothing will change when you do this, when you hold down the scene. So, um, and that, from what I've heard on the, uh, on the forums, is, is their way of combating any lag issues that would arise um, from very quick you know, MIDI manipulation. So, um, so the only ways that you can manipulate uh, the MIDI of your instrument are internal to these settings. And that being said, there are a ton of things you can still do. So for example, um, say I have this, uh, this note and I wanna just like give it a chord. Um, I can just like do this. And just change these notes. And, uh, and I can create chords that way. Um, I can P-lock them the same way I would, or I can even transpose certain notes up. And then these will move relative to it because they, they say that they're going up or down those semitones. So you could basically just operate off of changing the, the root of this note. Like I can imagine a universe where that song would be cool. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna fucking do it. Hold on. Uh, uh, and that was completely irrelevant. Anyway, if you have a keyboard, for example, which I do, um, you can also hold down a note and play different chords. So. Notice that the uh, these are basically it's akin to p locking. So if I take this node and I lock these notes to it, the original chord that I have mapped to this is still going to stay the same. Um, I can adjust the velocity, the default, um, but again, once I play something, the velocity is saved in. So if I play it quietly, you'll hear that. All right, so the amp page here in the MIDI section is the art page. Um, and in this case, we're going to, we're just gonna take a small dive into this because it's pretty complicated. Um, but suffice it to say that if you have a keyboard that doesn't have art capabilities, 
but you have an Octatrack, then you now have a keyboard that has ARP capabilities. Because essentially what this lets you do is you can, so if you double click the uh, AMP page, you can basically map your own, uh, so red represents playing, and you can, or actually green represents playing. So you can choose how long this thing is. You can make it like 16, or you can make it eight, or you can make it something weird like nine. And then you basically transpose these different green keys using this knob. And the cool thing about this, you can hold down multiple. Blah, blah, blah. Um, this probably isn't going to sound great. But once I turn it on, oh, and by the way, you can also set it to a specific key, which is pretty dope. So say I set it to true. actually sounds a lot better than I thought it would. And this will help if I set my instrument to unison, so I'm going to do that. Let's just do a eight bar, eight step phrase. And this sounds like a key of G thing, so I'm just going to set it to G major, which shouldn't change it because all these notes are in that mode. Why is, hold on. Why is, oh, right, okay, so let's set it to D. Sorry, I my music theory was a little off. So let's go to D major, because I need a C sharp. There we go. So I have this ARP, and no matter what note I play, So no matter what note I play, it's going to snap that to the D major scale. And this is a fun way to just play around. Even if you don't know like what these keys do, just go ahead and play with them. Honestly, this whole page could be uh, explained with a completely different tutorial, which I think I'm just going to do because I don't even fully understand it. Um, I'm a piano player by trade, so I don't really use the ARP quite as much as I could. Um, most of the time when I use it, it's to uh, save myself a shortcut of just playing, you know, like playing an ARP. Moving on, we have uh, LFO. And before I go to LFO, uh, I think it's important to cover these two pages because they are probably going to be the most important pages that you play with. At least that's, you know, that's my personal experience. So actually I can't say that. Anyway, so here we are um, in this setting, and we have two full pages that we can control the MIDI CC from this keyboard. And how do we do that? By going into the double click page, and if you hold function and this corresponding knob, for example, and press that, it'll listen for MIDI CC messages. So I can turn my knob for frequency on here, and it'll remember that. I can set my knob for uh, filter amount. And honestly, you really have to play with this because sometimes, depending on the way that your, your particular instrument is, in, uh, is designed, it's not, going to rem it's not gonna know certain things. And uh, that's one of the frustrating things I've found about um, uh, the MIDI section of this thing is that sometimes it's a little bit unpredictable. So for example, resonance here. Oh, yeah, there it is. And the more one-to-one -one your keyboard is, the less issues you'll have. So for example, on my base station, I noticed that um, there were certain functions uh, shared by the same um, faders, like the ADSR on the base station shares, uh, is, is used for both the filter and the, um, and the amplitude. In this case, we have two separate ones, so I think that creates a much clearer message. But on the base station, the way it's designed um, on the back end makes it so that you can't map those particular, or when you map them, it only corresponds to one of those settings. Now that I've set those, I can hit function knob and activate them. And now I can basically control it from both ends. So if I turn this knob for sub, uh, it's changing that on the, on the machine. 
So we're gonna turn off these real quick so we can hear it. So that was filter there. This is resonance. Oh wait, no, this is amount. This is resonance. So now that we have that, um, we can play with these knobs. And the really cool thing about this, which I wanted to show you guys, um, this is something I use all the time for my performances. So say I have this keyboard. It's pretty basic, um, but sometimes I don't want it to start with an open filter. Sometimes I'm starting a song with a really low. Right, so the ARP is still on. Sometimes I want to low on the filter. But on other songs, sometimes I want it to start with the filter open. So in order to do that, um, all I have to do is set the settings within here and save it to a part. Well, we have to also save it as that particular patch. So just to go through the, the sequence of what I just did, I went through my source page, I set the patch to this one. Next, I go into my settings page and knowing what these are, I set my filter to really low. I set my ARP to off. I set my amount to low. And I can do that from the keyboard as well. Um, but if you don't have it mapped, then you might get confused. So I try to do it from this side so that I know exactly what parameters the Octatrack is saving. So here's my resonance. Maybe I want a little bit of resonance. And maybe I don't want the sub, right? So now that I have that saved, I can save that part. And then from there, if I mess around with it, if I mess with the resonance, add the sub, do all these things, I can reload the part. And there I am. And this is, to, this is basically an internal setting within the Octatrack. So essentially what it's doing is when you load this up, it's saying load patch number 8, 308 to be specific, and set these MIDI CC signals to that setting. So you can essentially have one mother preset on your keyboard that you really like and create all these mini presets um, depending on what song you're playing. So if you like a patch a lot, but you don't want to make like nine slightly similar patches, then this is a really good way to evolve your patch in incremental degrees without taking up a lot of space on your keyboard. So let's say I have uh, a two pattern sequence. In the first pattern, I have just my MIDI section, which I played in by you know uh, pressing record and play and just playing it in. And I wanna take that to my next section, but this time I want my sub to be involved. And maybe I want my filter to So in my second pattern, I have a second part, which has a slightly adjusted version of the same patch. It's still loading patch number eight. Um, but in this case, since I have these hardwired, um, it's going to switch those settings over to the one that I'm, uh, to, a, to a different setting within that patch. Um, so now that I save them all, and you can hear them in action. And I can even fuck with the... And it'll reset once I go to here. And 
then beyond that, you can record now that I have this within the CC. Whether I use this knob or the one in here, I can basically record the performance over the course of my sequence. So now all of those movements are more or less recorded into my machine. And, uh, and so that creates a ton of versatility um, for what you might be playing. I think I'm just going to have to cap it here because um, I have other shit to do. <laughs> but um, if you come away with something in this video, let it be this CC mapping stuff. Um, take what you can from just the fact that you can map these things. Um, and once you have them mapped, um, you can pretty much just use them the way that you would use the knobs in the effects section or any other uh, P-locks um, in the audio section. Um, so while you can't use the crossfader for MIDI, you can use these trigs in really interesting ways and uh, get a lot of mileage out of just the settings you have on, um, on any synth that you plug in. I've kind of done a quick overview. I know that I didn't cover certain things and I apologize for that. Um, but if you leave questions um, and comments, the, that will actually support um, me coming up with a more coordinated way to approach this because it's it's pretty much like like if you thought the Octatrack was complicated, uh, not including MIDI, it's basically like the uh, the upside down of the Octatrack. It's like you could you know, and I know from you know the tutorials I've seen that like some people dedicate their entire Octatrack experience to the MIDI section. Um, obviously, there's some sampling going on, but I've definitely approached it thus far from the audio side. And um, and until I got the OB6, I didn't even have a poly synth that I could operate with the um, with the Octatrack, besides like plugging into a computer and that kind of, you know, it's not really the best way. So I've dabbled in it a little bit. Um, and you know what, honestly, the next tutorial will probably have something to do with um, how I use it. Um, within the confines of my own projects, um, how I use it to help accompany what I'm doing on the other side. So um, if that interests you, you know, keep following and, uh, and hopefully we can learn some more stuff down the road together. So um, thanks for watching and uh, see you guys next week.